şu an yayındayız hocam. Hello everyone. Hello Federico. It's very nice to have you here with us today. Um, before we start, I will make a short announcement in uh, Turkish about the technicalities. This session will continue in English. Okay. Ee, tekrar merhabalar herkese. Bu akşamki oturumumuza hoş geldiniz hepiniz. Ee, oturumumuz Şehir Plancılığı Odası YouTube kanalından hem İngilizce hem Türkçe olarak yayınlanacak. Ee, dolayısıyla YouTube kanalından dilediğiniz e, dilde oturumu takip edebilirsiniz. Sorularınızı tüm oturum boyunca YouTube'dan iletebilirseniz sevinirim. Son dakikaya kalırsa hani belki arkadaşlar onları iletecekler bize toparlaması daha kolay olur. Ee, sorularınız oldukça tabii ki iletirseniz. Ben hepinize verimli ve keyifli bir oturum diliyorum ve katıldığınız için hepinize çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ee, on behalf of the Chamber of City Planners of Turkey and Yıldız Technical University, I would like to welcome you all to the thematic keynote series of the ninth Planning Congress of Turkey, organized in celebration of the World Town Planning Day. So happy uh, town planning day to you all, even though it's actually tomorrow on the 8th of November, but we have started to celebrate it already since yesterday. Um, as you all know, the theme of this year's uh, Congress is the past experiences, the present context and the future horizons of planning. And we have been living in a state of planetary crisis, so to speak, which encompass economic, social, environmental spheres and um, urgent issues such as climate change, disasters, food security, migration, shelter, poverty and gender equality, whatever you name else, have been uh, cross-cutting concerns in many countries. And on top of that, now we have the COVID-19 pandemic, which has intensified these global challenges and deepened the current inequalities and vulnerabilities. So apparently we cannot go on like this and we have to rethink the way we build our cities. Therefore, in our Congress this year, we aim to underline the need for a paradigm shift and provide a platform to enable a discussion on transformative actions towards more equitable, inclusive, healthy and resilient cities and societies. Um, we have already been having a very fruitful time since yesterday, very fruitful uh, sessions uh, with a lot of nice presentations by researchers and very good discussion going on. And starting from today and for the next two days, we will have prominent international speakers. Our guest speaker today is Federico Savini. Uh, he will, he will uh, give his talk titled Towards an Urban Degrowth, Habitability, Finity and Polycentric Autonomy. Before introducing, introducing Federico, let me first introduce myself. I am Zeynep Enlil, Professor of Urban Planning at Yildiz Technical University and I will be moderating this session. And uh, Federico and I have some common interests and we have had the opportunity to work together in uh, some EU funded projects uh, before and we hope to collaborate our um, uh, studies again in the future. Uh, Federico Savini is an assistant professor in environmental planning, institutions and politics section at the University of Amsterdam. He combines approaches of political sociology, urban planning, and critical geography to the study of institutions and sociopolitical change in cities. His expertise ranges across the areas of land policy, land regulations, social innovation, environmental justice, and urban politics. In his works, he studies the politics that drive institutional change focusing on the different sets of regulations that shape city regions. Um, he studies a range of uh, phenomena, including real estate development, land use planning regulations, post-industrial development, environmental zoning, 
the financialization of land development, waste and metabolism of cities, the tacit social norms underpinning the ecological urbanism and housing commons. He was the main researcher and leading coordinator in the international projects that we worked together, namely Acrolap and Codaloop. And uh, they were both funded under the scheme uh, of JPI Urban Europe. He is now part of the community of degrowth scholars in Europe and the Netherlands. He is coordinator and curator of the master studio Future Cities and co-initiator and advisor of the social housing cooperative De Neue Ment in Amsterdam. I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. Um, yeah, so he is just the right person to talk about the future of planning maybe today for us. Uh, Federico will give his talk for about 40 minutes. Uh, then we will have your questions. And as I said in Turkish, please pose your questions in the YouTube channel during or after the talk. And before we start, I would like to thank all the organizers, the Chamber of City Planners, my colleagues at the Department of City and Regional Planning at Yildiz Technical University, all the participants who are with us this evening, and of course, our translators who have a very important task ahead. So um, I will uh, give the floor to you now, Federico, please. Thank you very much, uh, Zeynep, for this uh, beautiful introduction. I'm very happy to be here and uh, to be able to speak to the community of planners and architects and urban designers in Turkey. Um, and uh, I also would like to thank you specifically for inviting me to give this uh, uh, keynote. Um, and of course, let me thank you as well, the two translators, Sheren and Bahar, because without them, it would be very hard to uh, give this talk to countries else, like, like, uh, uh, uh, like the, the one where I live. So I, I really think this, they're doing an amazing job and very useful and important job. Thank you very much. So um, as Zeynep uh, uh, already introduced, I will give a talk about my most recent work on the notion of uh, urban degrowth. So in this talk, I will uh, introduce um, this idea of degrowth and I will apply it to planning and cities. And uh, I hope in 40 minutes, I will give you uh, a good concise, uh, um, uh, indeed summary of how interesting and important this idea is for planners and urban designers. So um, let me start uh, right away. I would like to start with a number, the 1.5 number that has become very important in our society. Many of you probably already know what I'm gonna say about it. The IPCC identifies the 1.5 degree as the maximum increase in temperature from the pre-industrial levels. If we want to stop the progressive extinction of our species. And this is actually a conservative and a hopeful estimate, I must say. So I took the lowest number in that sense. This number testifies the human-made destruction of our ecosystem. It represents the rap rapid loss in biodiversity and the downgrading of soil fertility. It also represents the rising of sea level and the risk of flooding and fires worldwide, just to cite a few examples. This picture on the right actually was a picture that shows some of the fires that took place in Turkey this summer. Um, this number, it also represents the social political consequences that we are facing due to these ecological changes. The loss of livable land is leading millions of people to migrate. This will raise nationalism and extremism. It will push towards new forms of colonialism to appropriate resources that are necessary for life. The 1.5 number tells us that our economy is based on logic of dispossession, extraction, and violence. Yet, this number also encapsulates the solution to these problems, a fundamental shift in mentality, one from an ideology of endless growth to a mentality centered on limits. It sets an upper limit, in fact. It indicates that our economic system needs to be radically rearranged in order to survive and prosper. And this is the essential paradigm shift 
that the notion of degrowth pursues, in fact. It rethinks the economic organization of our society in terms of stability within limits. This ambition will invest all aspects of socioeconomic organization. As I will argue later, this also provides with a very different position of planning theory and practice. The idea of degrowth is rooted on the recognition of limits. Degrowth identifies a socioeconomic system that is emancipated from the ideal of endless accumulation. It proposes a society that pursues economic reduction, downscaling, and deceleration. The limits posed by degrowth are both a constraint and an opportunity. And let me explain you why. On the one hand, degrowth rejects the illusion of the decoupling of economic output and environmental degradation. Resource efficiency is crucial to address ecological problems, of course, but it's not enough. Degrowth points as, at the problem of greenwashing and recognizes that our economic system is fundamentally biased towards accumulation. And this accumulation is insensitive to planetary boundaries. As you see in this image, there is a direct correlation between the growth of our GDP worldwide, in fact, and the environmental impact of our uh, life on the environment. On the other hand, the growth mobilizes the idea of limits in a positive way. It recognizes that by setting limits to endless accumulation and to the space that economic transactions have in our life, in our society and social relations, um, our lives, our social relations can become more fruitful. Downscaling is what generates well-being. The reduction of economic transactions leads to the improvement of creative social relations. It opens investments, in the economy of care, such as health and education, a different economy. Many of these assumptions are rooted in the observation of real life practices of degrowth. These real life practices often, very often, takes place in cities, in urban areas. Here you just, you see just few major publications in the field. Yet planners, architects, urban designers have been largely absent in the degrowth debate. This is something that we need to address because cities are very central to a degrowth transition. And I will explain you why now. We can say that cities are the engines of our current economic growth. The global gross domestic product is primarily generated in cities because it is there that the richest economic transactions are performed. These transactions are those, for example, in real estate, and infrastructure. Um, and of course, in, they, they regard their securitization, their financialization. It is in urban agglomerations that their asset value is the greatest and land is valued the most. The financial economy is not an abstract economy. It is rooted in urban transformations. However, the production of the urban environment is also the human activity that has the most environmental impact. Just to give you an example, urbanization demands globally 5,000 kilograms of raw materials per person each year. And this is an average that doesn't consider differences among countries. In 2050, as this graph on the left shows, this amount will actually double. Each human on Earth uses 18 kilos of sand each day to produce concrete. Concrete is today the most wanted material on earth today and is the actual most used material in cities. The average ecological footprint of city dwellers, which is the measure of the overall impact of people's lifestyle on the planet, is six times higher to those of less urbanized areas. And it is 15 times higher than any threshold on sustainability. These are averages but they give an idea of how cities, especially in the global north, are impacting our environment. Urban dwellers still tend to consume and travel more and further. And our built environment is planned, in fact, to promote those behaviors today. 
Furthermore, the World Resource Institute has recently published a report on the state of climate action. If we look at this report, we see that construction, transportation, and land use remain the sectors that are the least performing in terms of climate target. They are the ones that are lagging behind. This is a very big problem. The economic growth of cities has also dramatic social costs, not only environmental costs. The most attractive investments on land are those that bring the highest economic output. These are residential estates in prime locations, business centers with architectural landmarks, for example, industrial zones connected by high-speed trains, highways, or airports. The victims of these developments are all those people that live in areas with high rent gaps, the so-called dispossessed and evicted. These people suffer the perpetual surge of land productivity. Our current economy is built on a vicious circle, cycle. And uh, uh, you can see that in, an in this illustration on the left, urban growth leads to economic success. This economic success fuels investments in cities, attracts new investments. These investments in the built environment generate displacements and create new demands, which in turn pushes the economy even further. Urban growth basically relies on displacement and dispossession. If competition stops, development stagnates. And if development stagnates, socioeconomic differences increase. This leads to more social conflict. Cities become more divided and therefore less livable. We commonly understand this process as urban shrinkage, in fact, in many cases. It's a recession of cities that leads to social divisions. Now, planning has a contradictory role in this scenario. On the one hand, cities have been planned to promote economic efficiency and economic transactions. Planning increases land productivity to boost land markets and to make them work at the local and global scale. On the other hand, planners have dealt for a long time with the human and environmental negative impacts of this economic efficiency. The livability of urban areas has been a crucial task for planners since the post-war uh, era and even more so in the last 20 years. Yet the mainstream planning approaches of today are not very different than the so-called growth management approach of the late 70s. Today's version is called green growth management. This approach sees planners as somehow, we could say, managers of negative externality rather than active players in addressing their causes. This is what uh, the idea of eco-modernization fundamentally entails. The imaginary of the growth, which I propose today, is a clear critique to eco-modernization and to the role of planners in eco-modernization. Eco-modernization assumes that the existing social, political, and cultural institutions, and I will add regulations, can internalize the care for the environment. Against this idea, degrowth argues that the care of the environment needs radically different institutions that govern the development of cities. The challenge for us today and in the approximate future is to imagine a planning of the growth, an approach that is able to break the vicious circle of perpetual accumulation, and at the same time ensure social spatial justice and well-being. Now, the growth scholars and activists which are actually growing worldwide, have already given many suggestions in this direction. However, they have not yet engaged with planning directly. We can summarize the existing degrowth urban imaginary in three main groups. And this is based on my reading of a very, very big literature, which has different pieces. The development of low impact living through common property arrangements, the establishment of synergies between nature and the built environment. And third group is the improvement of direct democracy to govern urban space. Most used examples of these groups are, just to cite a few, slow mobility practices, 
like biking, one of the main symbols perhaps of degrowth in cities, housing commons, of course, and housing cooperatives, tiny living, so forms of living that reduce space and materials needed, local food productions. Other examples include agroecological productions and uh, uh, how they relate to urban development, such as the transition towns and the back to the land movements, as you see in the left here. These are highly inspiring uh, examples, of course, and they are real life examples. Yet this research, the available research, does not, does not explain what are the institutions that can enable the reproduction and upscaling of these practices in cities today. For those practices to prosper, planning needs to rethink its logic at a deeper level. This is not a new utopian project or a finished master plan, of course. Instead, this means to rethink the institutions and social norms that drive urban development. We must ask, what are the planning principles of an urban degrowth imaginary? This is the question that led my research today, and I will try to give you an answer to this now. To answer this question, we must first understand how cities grow. My argument here is that uh, there are three mechanisms of urban growth that needs to be addressed. The first is the promotion of regional competition through functional specialization. Secondly, the planning of land scarcity to increase land monetary value, the monetary value of land. And finally, that zoning has the main tool to create economic value. Let me um, take you through each of them briefly. As any other market in contemporary capitalism, urban development fosters specialization and competition. To increase productivity, planning has organized regional areas as machines, in fact, where each piece of the region has a specific function. Regions as uh, urban agglomerations are organized into, for example, residential zones, which are distant from business zones. Retail areas are separated from living and production areas. Tourist areas are isolated from local populations. Agricultural areas in particular are far from where people shop, eat and live. Here on the left, you see areas specialized in large-scale industrialized agriculture. One of the many consequences of this specialization in regions. These, are, these areas are the largest emitters of nitrogen today, which is a gas that is poisonous for life. This picture was taken in the Netherlands. The most immediate consequences of this organization of the region is our dependency on fast mobility and large-scale infrastructures, in fact but also the concentration of pollution and the creation of wasteland. Social segregation is also a consequence of this functional specialization between areas of production and areas of social reproduction. This has also produced an urban lifestyle that compartmentalizes daily life and that is often unpleasant to live. Here on the right, you see the high-speed railway network connecting major Chinese cities. This network has become the essential infrastructure of Chinese economic growth. Its development pushed for the urbanization of rural areas and contributed to separate the rural from the urban. Planning has tried for years to manage these problems, but it has failed to recognize that it is the pursuit of economic growth that produces these patterns in the first place. Let me move to the second critique of urban growth. The second process that drives urban growth is the maximization, maximization of land value through scarcity. Planning uh, is an organizer of scarcity. Just as the scarcity of time makes humans looking for more productive uses of each single minute, scarcity of land leads market players to maximize land values. Planning defines if and how and when a piece of land can be used and developed. By doing this, it produces expectations on the increase of land values. The least land available for development in a particular area, the highest the expectation of the increase of value. Scarcity is necessary to economic value. 
The problem with this is that cities today depend on land productivity to pay for public services. Most common reasons for politicians and planners themselves to embrace a market logic is often that it allows them to generate revenues that then pay for services that they see necessary for the public good. Things about you know, paying for schools or, or uh, pedestrian zones and things like this. The notion of public good is also politically and often arbitrarily defined, depending on who rules a particular city or a region. Yet this system hardly works. Public revenues have been progressively decreasing, as we know. Neoliberal policies have reduced the number of public benefits that trickle down to urban dwellers. This vicious cycle never stops and is highly unsustainable. The least public money, the more the incentive to turn land into assets. As a consequence, the most invest investments concentrate in areas that are already wealthy, such as prime locations, or with high rent, rent gaps. These are the areas, in fact, that generate the most value. And these developments lead to displacement and social polarization, as I said before. This figure on the left shows the new strategic plan of the city of Amsterdam, just published. This is similar to all strategic plans in major cities. They identify high rent gap areas and increase development pressure there. I think that planning has a larger role to play in stopping this cycle. From being an organizer of markets, as uh, it does today, it can perform as a counter power against market mechanisms. Later, in a second, I will argue how. The third institution that drives urban growth is zoned land use. Markets need property to function. Property rights in land markets are organized through zoning. Yet planners still use a technique of zoning that was invented decades ago to address the problems of today, actually. This technique may be called Euclidean zoning. Um, it's a practice that divides land into single units that have specific uses. This way of zoning works in a geometrical and rationalist way, in fact. Planners divide land into specific uses and then combine these uses according to what it is believed to be good planning at a particular time and place. In this way, they can organize property and use rights that are exchangeable. For example, just to give an example, they can promote the selling of agricultural land in exchange of land for houses, which bears more, more profits in urban areas. Euclidean zoning is therefore essential to an approach to property that is, we can say, subjective because it assigns uses to single legal subjects. This has reduced the possibility to develop forms of property that are held in common, neither public nor private. It also forecloses the possibility to experiment with new combinations of functions. These are used categories of land that may not even exist today in the zoning inventory of planners. In sum, for an urban degrowth, it is necessary to define a technique of spatial organization that is not Euclidean, geometrical or subjective. As I will argue next, these techniques must, must be more relational. So a relational technique of zoning. The question now is, how can we rethink these three mechanisms of planning from a degrowth perspective? For a planning of degrowth, I propose three new approaches to urban development. First, the promotion of a polycentric and autonomous regional system. Secondly, the use of affinity rules in planning instead of scarcity. And third, a tool of organization, of land organization that is relational because it strives for habitability and not functionality. Let me take you through each of them. From a degrowth perspective, cities need to be autonomous from the imperative of endless growth to be sustainable and just. Autonomy is here understood in both ecological and political terms. 
Ecological autonomy means that urban areas should be able to self-sustain as much as possible their needs and of resources. These needs are, for example, obviously, food, energy, uh, waste processing, natural areas, but also health services, jobs, education, and all functions of social reproduction. The building of connections between urban, natural, and rural environments is central to this process. Cities should be rethought as bioregions. Bio These are urban ecosystems that seek for the maximum overlap between the agroecological, the social, and the political dimension of living. Ecological autonomy and political autonomy depend on each other. Becoming self-sufficient is both a condition and a result of a political culture of collective self-provision. The commoning of material resources is central to this process. Commoning makes urban dwellers both co-producers and co-owners of these resources. To do so, it strives to reach a larger overlap between the territories of resource production and those of resource consumption. Not all resources can be provided locally, of course. This is one of the major critiques to this proposal. You can think about uh, specialized health care, for example. Yet, we have a solution to this problem. The making of federations of cities is crucial to ensure that these services are provided in a coordinated way. Differently from most regional networks existing today, these federations need to be understood from the bottom up, according to what we may call an inverse subsidiary principle. This process will lead to governing institutions that are very different from existing nation states, of course. These institutions will be rooted on the ecological specificity and the autonomy of urban areas and not on their geopolitical power. These institutions will likely to have also very different geographical boundaries than the nation states that we have today, if we rethink them in terms of bioregions, in fact. The history of planning thought has already envisioned similar directions, in fact. There is a lot of tools we can make use here as planners and architects. Friedman, Friedman already talked about the agrometropolis in the early 80s. Bookchin used the term bioregions in a more anarchistic fashion already in the 70s. Uh, Mumford talked about ecological regions already in the late 70s as well. The notion of bioregionalism should move beyond the field of landscape architecture, where it's mostly used today, and be taken very seriously also by planners, I, I, I believe. There are already examples of this form of regional organization. Uh, there are regional networks of food producers, for example, that federate together into territories that surpass the urban and rural divide. Here you see an example on the right, the Territorios Campesinos Agroalimentarios in Colombia. This is a federation of local food producers in Colombia that have organized themselves as a regional network. And this network encloses cities around the uh, uh, sector of food production. In the housing sector here in the center, we could mention the German Mitzheiser Syndicate. This offers an example of a federated network of housing commons, housing providers in the whole Germany that surpasses regional state boundaries. And it is built from the bottom up, starting from the different projects of housing cooperatives in the country that connect together as a national, in fact, or international indeed, uh, housing provider. My second proposition is that this self-sufficiency needs to be organized around principles of finity. It is basically impossible to be self-sufficient and at the same time acquire limitless amount of resources. This is why limits are essential to a degrowth urbanism. My argument here is that institutions of finity must guide a future, the future of planning. Planners need to operate in terms of minimum and maximum limits, minimum and maximum standards. How to reach and keep those limits should be object of democratic deliberation. What functions should the city limit, for example, is a good question. What is the maximum level of pollution of residential development or soil or water consumption or CO2 emissions? 
possible for well-being in a particular area. On the other hand, what is the minimum level of social housing, green space, biodiversity, air quality, educational facilities, you can name it, in each neighborhood or city? These are important questions which require us as planners to think in terms of affinity, because doing so can open new spaces for democracy and give true legitimacy to policies of spatial redistribution. On the one hand, it permits to deliberate about the necessary qualities for well-being of a particular place. On the other, it defines the meaning of excess or too much in urban development. With targets of reduction, it is possible to enable social spatial redistribution and the socialization of urban resources. As Roworth, it Roworth has already explained in her donut economic theory, who's one of the graphs you see here on the right, it is through the making of these limits that we can reach a regenerative and redistributive economy. At the basis of this notion, there is the idea that endless wealth accumulation is dangerous for society. This is quite a statement in a current liberal ideology, but we must make this statement at this stage. As the philosopher uh, Robbins argues, by the way, work that works in Utrecht here in, in the Netherlands, the climate crisis called for a new politics of limitarianism. This is the ethics of setting limits to excessive wealth. Also here, there are existing examples from which planners can get inspiration. The much used congestion charges, for example, or parking space limitations work in this way after all. We could imagine a more extensive use of these tools. Other examples include caps to multiple properties or to flights in a particular region or to flights between a, a minimum amount of distance. A great example of how these finity rules can work is the Deutsche Wohnen and Co. campaign in Berlin, as well as the rent cap system in Berlin or in Amsterdam, where I live. These campaigns this campaign is proposing to expropriate large developers with more than 200,000 properties of their excessive units. The rent cap is another tool that allows to regulate rental markets. These are all existing projects and not dreams. They already find great consensus among inhabitants as we saw in Berlin recently with the referendum for this campaign, which was very successful in fact. The revenues generated through the limitation of excess can be then redistributed to supply essential services in those areas with scarce urban amenities. Thinking in terms of affinity instead of scarcity opens up a planning approach that prioritizes the maintenance of equilibrium and addresses the fact that development cannot be never ending. It rejects the idea that the monetary offsetting of development externalities is enough to foster reduction. This is the mainstream greenwashing of existing urban growth. In fact, I move now to my third proposal. Earlier, I argued that the division of land into Euclidean, geometrical and functional zones is what structures markets into individual land property systems. The task for a degrowth planner is not to abandon altogether any form of land organization, of course. It is instead to devise one that is relational and context dependent. I here propose a form of land organization that is geared towards habitability. Differently from the most common used term of livability or livability, sorry for my pronunciation, a concept that is used very much already since decades in planning, Habitability, the notion of habitability, rejects an anthropocentric view on cities. A habitat is made of a relation between the ecological properties of a territory and its social spatial organization. In biology, habitability is the capacity of a particular physical space to support the activity of an organism, that is, to provide the set of resources and conditions required for its way of life. Humans are these organisms, but their survival depends on the prosperity of other species, such as plants, bacteria, birds, insects. 
we need, we as human need both relational and ecological resources. Yet our current understanding of livability has excessively focused on the social psychological com component of life, the resources that we need for our relations and our mind. We developed an understanding of well-being as being sociable. This understanding is certainly important, but um, it is not what it's not the only one that ensures the survival of our species, of our body. It does downplay the role that ecosystems have in the psychophysical survival of humans. Planning, in fact, using these terms of livability and focusing on functional geometrical land use has somehow substituted the biophysical resources necessary for human life with those necessary for, to the survival of markets. Cities today lack nature, food production, clean air for healthy living. These are problems that are very common in major agglomerations all over the world. They are ridden with heat waves, pollution, and too much noise. These factors push the boundaries of our bodies with consequential mental illnesses and respiratory problems, just to cite a few examples. Cities regularly expel the wasted nutrients that can be reused for food production. They emit CO2 and compost instead of using it. My point here is that the increased economic diversity of our cities is coming at costs of human survival itself. I understand habitability, therefore, as a shift of subject of land rights. The right to use land moves from the individual owner of, to the social ecological relation that the land produces. Habitability allows planners to regulate urban transformations, asking simple questions such as how much this development increase CO2 or nitrogen emissions beyond reasonable levels for life? Does this project increase biodiversity or decreases it? Does this or that project nurture the necessary diversity for social well-being or rather reduces that diversity? These are just examples of the essential questions of planning in our times. The way they are answered, however, will depend on each specific place and city. There is no master plan, but just a framework that identifies patterns of reduction and improvement of socio-ecological qualities. In many cases, these developments will include elements of reduction and downscaling. As I argued before, affinity logic and the use of affinity rules is crucial to enable this process. Here, planners can get inspiration from centuries old modalities of governing land, which have been progressively disappearing in the world today, and especially in large cities. There are already cases of indigenous communities that instead of organizing land in separate parcels with different uses, use land according to basic principles of habitation. They basically perform habitability in the sense I mean it. And these principles become the pillar of urban commons. So the commoning of land is based on, a, on the overcoming of this division between land uses and subjective association of property right. One example here on the left is the Derechos de Naturaleza um, of, the, of Ecuador. Uh, it's a constitutional uh, chart that endows the ecosystem with constitutional rights to protect it. The, uh, on the right here, you see a planning exercise that the Haida Kwai community of Skydegate in Canada has made a few years ago. Uh, this is an indigenous community of Canada, which uh, is founded, uh, whose land is founded on a system of rights that govern the use of land as common resource. These norms include the injunction to, for example, use and grow food as a medicine. This is a simple statement, a simple value, which then, however, as you see in this graph, which is a bit complex, however, uh, is translated into land use practices. These are just inspiring examples. However, planners are already geared to use these relational tools. They can shift the focus from predefining ideal combination of zones on paper and use more complex frameworks that guide urban development starting from an ecosystemic perspective. 
Now I'm now heading to the conclusion. So um, thank you for bearing with me until now. Um, in this presentation, um, I argued that degrowth can offer a powerful imaginary for planners, architects, urban and landscape designers. It offers a conceptual and practical toolkit for the reorganization of human settlements. Degrowth urges us to imagine a form of social spatial organization that, is, that recognizes the limits of ecosystems. By recognizing limits to the economy, planners can finally focus on those priorities that are actually necessary for the well being, health, and creativity of urban societies. I have argued in this presentation that to envision a plan for degrowth, we need to rethink our planning system in terms of political and ecological autonomy within regions. And these regions are polycentric, in fact. This autonomy requires to shift the planning paradigm from one of scarcity to one of affinity and to devise rules that apply and work towards that affinity. Finally, the way to organize and use land, I argued, must be informed by the notion of habitat and habitability and not on the anthropocentric notion of livability only. Now, I would like to conclude this talk using one image, the image that you already saw in the background of my title slide. This image um, will be the cover of a book on post-growth planning that will come out um, early next year. So I hope you will look for it later on. This book has been co-edited with my colleagues, Antonio Ferreira and Kim von Schoenfeld, um, and um, will contain much more ideas uh, than the one I just explained today. This picture on the right is a lens, shows a landscape artwork made by an Italian artist called Mario Staccioli. And this artwork is, artwork is called The Ring. This is a, circ a circle, circle made of metal, iron metal, installed in the countryside of Tuscany, in the center of Italy. Maybe some of you recognized the background. In my view, this artwork represents the positions that degrowth planners have. They, these planners frame the territory. They make sense of it by setting boundaries to the viewers. Yet they do not interfere or intervene on the territory as bulldozers. They enhance the qualities of place by setting the focus on what is really important. As the hilly landscape in the front of the ring, cities cannot be controlled, yet planners influence their working by producing imaginaries of place. These are the frames that create meaning and express values. Just as the simple red ring shows, the production of meaning can be a micro intervention, a small scale intervention, a subtle action that is coherent with the specific qualities of place. Yet, and this is very important, just as the iron material of the ring Planning must have the courage to set clear boundaries. It should devise tools that are able to regulate the perpetual push to economic transactions. I hope this, that this principle will become a new ethic of planning. And this is for me the most important contribution that I hope to give to this Congress. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you all for listening to my talk. And uh, I would like also to wish you a good um, next three days of uh, uh, Congress. Thank you very much for listening. I will stop the yeah. screen sharing. Well, uh, thank you very much, Federico, for this really thought-provoking um, or food for the mind, actually, uh, contribution. Uh, you have set uh, not only a, a very sensible vision or imagery, uh, for future, but also it's a difficult task. You have provided us with clues to how to operationalize it. It's not an easy task, of course. Planners have perhaps um, limited maybe uh, power to change the whole world. But if we can change our frame of mind from, as you say, from uh, scarcity to finity, which is a very important notion actually knowing that things have an end there are limits of course it's very um, uh, it's a different 
um, emphasis, actually. It's something that we know maybe, but it's, it's a different frame of mind. And also from livability to habitability is another important point, which uh, puts not only the humans at the uh, center of, um, uh, of the world, but all the, the, the, the environment, the ecological system of which the humans are actually a part of this is something that also is very, very valuable. And of course, this polycentric autonomous regions, instead of functional zoning and um, competition among regions and so on, instead, we have to build solidarities from bottom up, I guess. So this was really very, very nice. I, there are a few questions. I will uh, uh, quickly go to that because we have limited time. And maybe it is better if I read them in Turkish rather than trying to translate it into uh, English. Uh, I'm sure our translators will do a better job in that. Okay, so our first question is, bir arkadaşımız soruyor, diyor ki ekosistemi tehdit eden kentsel büyüme sonsuz zenginlik odaklı düşünceyi tersine çevirmek için önerilen yöntem nedir? Now you have talked about this inverse um, uh, way of looking at it. Uh, and then she, he continues, or he or she, uh, yerelde küçük ölçekli yaşanabilirliği ve sonlu kaynağı esas alan örgütlenmeler mi? Yoksa üst ölçekteki politikaların dönüşümüne yönelik bir çaba mı sergilenmeli? Ya da bu iki mücadele biçimi birlikte mi yürütülmeli? I think this is a very hardcore question uh, that also I had uh, in mind. This is from our uh, General Secretary of the Chamber of uh, City Planners from Ayhan Erdoğan. Uh, another question is from our um, uh, President of the, um, uh, of the Chamber, Gencay Sertar. Uh, he asks, Küçülme planlaması gibi radikal bir önerinin önündeki riskler nelerdir? And then we have one last question. I don't know if it's, um, you can keep that in mind or shall we go one by one? Uh, oh, okay. He goes on. He says, yepyeni sınır ve işleyişler tanımlanırken mevcut işleyişten para kazananlara karşı mücadele zemini nasıl kurulmalıdır? Have you been able to follow or anything that you want me to repeat or the translators to repeat? I, I know I understood the translator did a great job. Okay. Yes. Okay, then the floor is yours. I hope to have captured all the questions which are very relevant and I'm really happy to receive them. Um, let me start with the uh, first one, uh, which I assume refers also to the difficulty to change a bit the ideology, the, the ideology mm -hmm. behind planning. Um, the way we, we think planning uh, must be really radically rethought. As I argued, I think the first step to do that, there are, there are in particular three steps, in fact. One is that planners must, first of all, start thinking in terms of self-sufficiency uh, and self-provision when looking at city regions, which are in fact the most important uh, um, geopolitical scale in terms of urban growth today. They are the largest uh, basically economic engines of our economy. Looking at city region and thinking and asking basically the simple question, is this region self-sufficient? And what, what does it mean to be self-sufficient? What does it mean? And what are the functions that might be missing here means to rethink the regional network, not in terms of economic success anymore, but also in terms of the ability to provide for the life of the people living there. If we ask this simple question, we will realize that many of the regions where we live today are, complete, are scoring very badly in that sense. All the food I eat comes from very far in the world. Um, many of the clothes I wear come from very far in the world. Now, I'm not saying that we will become completely self-sufficient. Of course not. But I'm just saying that already asking these questions and planning thinking that terms can open up completely different perspectives, which are much more sustainable to use that word. The second change in mentality, as also Zeynep underlined, is to really think in terms of affinities, so in terms, in terms of excess. So what are the functions that are excessive 
and those that are excessively impacting the environment. And uh, um, lastly, I think we should really look at biodiversity and ecosystem qualities within regions as a main planning object and subject, in fact, put them back at the center. Nowadays, we plan from, for, from the perspective of um, often from eco uh, economic transactions and not ecological transactions. That must be, I think, very central. Now, the a second uh, question was about bottom-up versus top-down processes, I understand. So, mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, it's, well, actually, the, the question is trying to say that what are the risks uh, that are in, yeah. in front of this degrowth yeah. uh, proposal? Yeah. And uh, when looking at uh, uh, the, the, the functioning uh, of the existing system and the people who are benefiting or earning from it, actually, what would be the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, how should I say, the basis of uh, struggle or confronting that uh, resistance in a way by the yeah. people who are benefiting from this what can the planners do or planning do? Yes, let me ask, let me answer this question first and then go back to the risks. I think that the transition to the growth needs a very strong polit uh, politics uh, coming from the bottom up, in fact. I mean, the mobilization of inhabitants of cities, those that mostly suffer the consequences of economic growth, is essential to this process. Just, I mentioned the case of Berlin and their campaign. Mm -hmm. This is just an example of how the majority of a population in the city is telling politicians, look, we need quality, we need affordable rent, we cannot anymore do politics for the large uh, investment trust and for the large property developers that owns thousands and thousands of properties. And the politicians in that case are listening to this because the mobilization is very big. Now, I think there is also another point to make. The elite the, the, the, the, the so-called elite that is in power today and that earns out of the growth of regions, it's also, I think, going to change. We will change it with a much more diverse and much more decentralized network of economic subjects that will actually prosper out of the growth. Think in terms about the industry of renewables or the industry of local food production or the industry of uh, uh, architects, the, Thousands of architects busy in developing different forms of customized tiny housing and tiny living or circular productions. This is a new elite, I would call it. I mean, mm -hmm. I hope that the idea of elite will disappear one day, but it's a new market indeed coming up as soon as the existing one, the one of the fossil uh, economy will, will go down. Now, this is more easier said than done, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a process of change about the risks. So what is the risk of degrowth? The most common risk of um, undertaking degrowth policies is that um, degrowth turns into recession or shrinkage. It's a risk mm -hmm. that is always there. If we downscale, we risk to kill the economy, which will have effects mm -hmm. on the people living in cities. This mm -hmm. is a very important risk that we need to avoid. Mm -hmm. But to avoid that, I think it's essential to think in terms of redistribution of mm -hmm. resources. I think today uh, it is the main, the main political item in the agendas of all politicians, especially in cities, is how to redistribute wealth and also spatial wealth from areas where it is highly accumulated, excessively accumulated mm -hmm. to areas that lack that wealth. And I think in terms in, think, thinking in terms of minimum standards, so what is the minimum level of qualities that each neighborhood must have it's a very important step in that sense. Um, I think degrowth, I personally think degrowth is, uh, um, let's say, the solution to many of the risks we're running today. First mm -hmm. of all, the one of extinguishing ourselves as a human species on the planet. So mm -hmm. I also think that this is a, a, a worthwhile uh, road to take, um, mm -hmm. which is a very different one than the one we have been taking until today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and planners can experiment with this. With mm -hmm. this, uh, yeah, thank you very much. There are a few more very nice questions if you have time, and also if our translators have time, I'd like to pose them as well. 
Uh, Erhan, our, uh, our, my colleague Erhan Kurtarur, he asks, uh, first he thanks you uh, for this presentation and uh, for reminding us that we have to look at things in a different uh, perspective. Uh, and he wants to, uh, he, want, he would like to have you evaluate the degrowth uh, perspective from two different angles. One, he says that degrowth or growing degrowth may have a negative connotation. Can we have a more positive connot uh, a word that has a more positive connotation rather than uh, this? And the second question he asks, um, uh, what, should, what is the political um, embracement or uh, uh, direction of this approach? Is it, is it a capitalist utopia or should we use um, a different uh, definition for it? So is it within the, is it again, in a way, I think he's trying to say a way to reproduce the system or are we, be able to, are we going to be able to maybe impact, have an impact in the structural, the larger system, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay, it's the same thing. And then there are two more questions, again, uh, related to capitalism. Um, and our colleague Yusuf Ekiji says that um, capitalism has a continuous tendency to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, while this is so, how are we going to achieve degrowth? How are we going to achieve policies that will encourage degrowth? Uh, or do you mean a more radical change in the system? Yeah. Uh, yes. And then, oh, you, you, this is your uh, degrowth may have a negative connotation. Yeah, I'm negative. just taking notes, sorry. I, okay, great, <laughs> so there great. are many yes. questions. <laughs> yes, now the floor is yours, okay. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if the viewers can see the chat, but I'm taking oh. notes of the questions. Good, so, yeah. Uh, I, um, uh, you know, I don't think they, say, they don't see it, yeah. Okay, I good. Yeah. They are just notes, uh, so yeah. I can answer them. Okay. Um, so the, the negative connotation of degrowth, I, it is true. It's one of the common critiques that people uh, come with uh, when they hear the word degrowth. Yet um, the, the, the assumption with, behind the word degrowth is that we need to really, really put clear that it's a, it's a practice against economic growth, not growth of you know, our society at large, but economic growth. So GDP in particular. So, the word degrowth is debated within the field, but it makes a very clear statement that we need to criticize the excessive obsession with GDP. Now, if there is another word, there are, honestly, uh, there are many words out there. Uh, the degrowth is the one that is the most uh, used by many movements uh, in Europe in particular, because in fact, it is very, very critical to the obsession with economic growth. It, it sets a very clear enemy, let's put it this way. Now, what is the political direction of this approach? Within the degrowth debate, there are many, many uh, political groups. They are from the eco-socialist to the most anarchist one. There is groups that are very clearly anti-capitalist to others that are actually more oriented to the variety of economies within capitalism. So it's, it's an ongoing debate. My argument is that we should not think in terms of master plan, like a uh, in terms of uh, an anti-capitalist system that is already set out there. But we need to start from the bottom up, from the practices. We need to start criticizing key mechanisms of, current economic, of the current economic system. And planners have a very strong role in that. Um, for example, looking at urban development, and real estate development, first of all. This is not ex explicitly anti-capitalist, but it does, it does uh, target the way capitalist, capitalists work. So degrow, a degrowth society, and this is my opinion, it's likely to be very different from the current capitalist, financialized capitalist system that we have today. The notion of commons as well, it's very clearly used in this, in this way. Now, there was another question about um, how do we reach uh, radical change? So what type of policies 
to, en to enact in order to get to a degrowth uh, uh, society. I think that here we must learn from the long history of degrowth since the early 90s. So degrowth movements are rooted in movements, which are also strongly uh, urban movements. These movements also are movements against the uh, existing uh, manifestations of economic growth. Think about just to cite one that is very common in, uh, that you know, uh, it's just like the movement of the Taksim Square in, in Istanbul. These movements clearly say, we need to stop this type of development. And these movements are the, the, the, the germs, the, the, let's put it this way, the seeds of, of, a, de of a degrowth politics. Of course, they will stimulate, hopefully, also policies uh, um, within the institutions, existing institutions that are able, hopefully, to respond to those movements. That's at least my hope. And I think this will lead to something that we might call as radical change, opposite to what we might understand as incremental change, which is very commonly understood and used today. Um, so these are the three questions I captured. I hope I answered all of them. Yes, uh, in your notes, uh, okay. Uh, okay, there is another final question. Uh, our colleague Oz Fatih Bayraktar, he asks, uh, in a society which is uh, rapidly becoming a um, cons consumer society, how is it possible or what should be the strategies to uh, ha have people realize and um, uh, appropriate the idea of degrowth? How can we make them uh, appropriate this idea while we are trying to grow and become this yes. consumer society? Yes, yes, of course. This is a very important question. The mm -hmm. ideology of growth, just to use the Gramscian idea of the ideology, goes all the way to our own mind to our own perception of our own well-being so we today assume that consuming makes us good nice so that, that buying stuff makes us happy no um so the, the greatest challenge is to change that ideology also within the mind of the people and here there's a lot of research in the growth scholarship that looks at the new practices of consumption there is an emerging movement worldwide of people that are deliberately downscaling their consumption uh, some call them uh, minimalist uh, lifestyle, for example. This is still a very um, elitarian type of uh, uh, lifestyle, but I think there is a lot of potential there. Um, um, there is a, the potential, in fact, to, to develop a different understanding of well-being, which is independent mm -hmm. from consumption and excessive work, by the way, as well, and more related to uh, care, social relation, taking care of things, um, there is a lot of these indications, and they're not so marginal anymore. There are many, many examples of movements that are, you know, becoming very popular, uh, even on Spotify, Netflix, uh, all major publishers like Penguin Books. They publish all of these things. These are, of course, machines to sell knowledge, but there is, I think, a lot of potential there to rethink the way people uh, uh, look at their well-being. So I think this is a, a, also a narrative that degrowth politics could adopt, saying, you know, you can be happier and wealthier if you consume less, and of course, if you work less. Now, this, of course, has clear, clear uh, class uh, implications. So mm -hmm. many people cannot work less. Mm -hmm. But the question is, maybe those that can work less should start with that step, just as those that emit more CO2 and our wealthier should start decreasing their CO2 emissions. So um, yeah. it is an argument also in terms of, okay, who should start with this process? There is this clear responsibility, an historical responsibility that we need to reflect upon. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, there is one last, I don't know if we have time. Uh, again, from Erhan Kurtarur. He is asking, what is the... Um, uh, the uh, I translatorlarımız orada benim de kafam yoruldu galiba alt limiti bilemedim nasıl diyeceğimi bir anda küçülmede alt limit nasıl tarif edilmeli sizce zaten küçük olanların veya küçülmekte olanların beklentisi büyüyenlerin küçülmesi ne, ne olmalı hmm. 
So the expectation on downscaling and how to define these limits. Yes, I, I, this is a very important question. I think this is essential that the, the object of discussion and deliberation is the limit itself. If we think about planning today, how we do community participation, how we do community-led planning, what we do, we talk about, okay, what is your ideal neighborhood? <laughs> how would you put, you know, uh, how would you spend this money? Sometimes we involve citizens asking them, how would you improve this street or that street? How would you uh, uh, retrofit your houses, et cetera, et cetera. We talk about plans with them. We do a lot of this participation. But what we do not do is to talk about what is the, the, the level of, of quality that you want to have in general, or what do you think is too much here in this neighborhood? We don't talk about what is excess and what is the minimum. We just talk about wishes in many cases, which is also why participation comes sometime, becomes some sort of dramaturgical uh, um, theater that leads to nothing in many cases. Mm -hmm you make plans that then are not realized. But I think the object of the deliberation should be the limit, the, exactly this should be, okay, what is the maximum amount of cars that you want in your neighborhood? What is the, max, the minimum amount of green uh, that you want there? And this should take place not only at the neighborhood level, but at the whole city regional level. So the deliberation that is behind also regional planning should address this topic. And I do not see that happen, even in Amsterdam here. Uh, we planners here think in terms of growth, of, in terms of uh, you know, goals uh, for achieving political goals, but they don't think in terms of limits um, that can be actually lo truly long lasting. Um, mm -hmm. So I think this, this um, it's important. Then I don't know if I, un I understood correctly the second part, which was about the expectations on downscaling uh, yeah. Yes, uh, he is saying uh, that uh, the ones that are already downscaled or that are small, uh, sh should they be um, expecting the ones that are growing to downscale? So, I mean, you have already, I think, uh, answered that question somehow. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, oh. just to maybe reiterate a bit, if we think in terms of limit, then we, we can indeed do what we call redistribution. So yeah. we can say, okay, this excess needs to be reduced. And by through that reduction, which hopefully comes through also taxation, we can promote all those mm -hmm. things that are not yet there. Let me give you another famous example. Just 10 years ago, more or less, I was in Paris. Uh, there was a new mayor. Uh, a left-wing mayor, this mayor decided, clearly said, very simple policy, he said, Bertrand Delanoe was the mayor, he said, every arrondissement in Paris, every district in Paris needs to have 30% of social housing, minimum, dot, this was the policy. And I found it a very strong policy, which activated a whole new planning project all over the city in order to reach that minimum standard. And I found that very powerful and, um, and I think it worked. Now we see Paris becoming also a, fr a front runner in terms of thinking in terms of uh, livability. But I mean, that policy was very simple, very clear and in fact informed planning in a very, very strong way. So I think that by setting this minimum standard, you could also say, okay, what do we downscale in order to make that space for mm -hmm. that social housing? And what they did, is that they downscaled many functions which were considered indeed unwanted in many neighborhoods mm -hmm. uh, in terms of ecological uh, uh, damages indeed. They, mm -hmm. they downscaled also street pavements, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, they increased uh, bike lanes and things like this. So I think this is just an example of how we can rebalance uh, planning in terms of thinking, in terms of habitability, uh, as I said uh, before. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Federico. This was uh, a good ending, actually, to again reminding us about this uh, excess and how to redistribute. Redistribution is, a, of course, very um, important part of it. And also it reminds us that we need to not only change our frame of mind as planners, but we also have to tr try again to have an impact on the politicians as well without 
having the politician, uh, the, the, the decision makers actually uh, on this side, it is impossible perhaps to have uh, a larger impact. You know, we can only move uh, with small steps maybe, but this was a very, uh, I think, illuminating um, speech. Thank you for uh, being with us tonight and having all this time uh, from your home in the Netherlands. And it's very nice to have this technology so that at least, you know, when we cannot travel or maybe if we do not want to travel because we do not want to contribute to CO2 emissions, <laughs> we can always be at least together in this way. Uh, so um, I think uh, we are out of time. Thank you, thank you very much again, and hope to see you uh, somewhere in the future, in, in Istanbul, maybe. Thank you very much. Again, thank you, indeed. Zeynep, for inviting me here. Yeah, thank you. Okay, herkese iyi akşamlar diliyoruz. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Özellikle çevirmenlerimize bu saate kadar da bize yardımcı oldukları için katılımcıların hepsine çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Federico Savini'ye de aynı şekilde e, bu çok e, katkılı konuşması için e, teşekkürlerimizi sunuyoruz. İyi akşamlar diliyoruz. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye.